So now um, I'm delighted that we have one of our plenary sessions and we have um, going to look at solidifying CCCM's role with regard to facilitating solutions. And I'm going to invite Dare up on stage who will facilitate this. And we also, and my microphone keeps talking. Oh. Leaving it as it is is probably the best thing, isn't it? That's a very good solution. Um, and we have three fabulous panelists. We, we were a bit worried that we were going to have three fabulous panelists because we had to connect with one and then we had to find another, but we've managed to find and connect to them. And so we'd like to welcome the panelists up on stage and I'll hand over to you, Dave. Just needs to work out how to turn it on. Okay. Um, panelists, please come to the stage. Um, uh, Christina, you're moving from one table to another, but that's not actually called the solution. Slow as you're getting closer and closer to the stage. Displacement. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, um, we have three panelists of whom two are with us in person and the third is joining us online from Ukraine. Um, I would introduce the panelists, say a few opening words on what exactly is this session is about um, and then we will have a small exercise also with you so we can energize ourselves a little bit. So first, starting online, we have our colleague Miranda. She's a senior CCCM cluster coordinator in Ukraine. Uh, we have Andrew Mina here, and he is the uh, du Regional Durable Solutions Coordinator from the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat. And then we have our dear colleague, Christina. She is now a program officer in DTM IOM, and she has been also working in many other uh, contexts on the campus. What I have been hearing in the, in the past months that the humanitarians have to be able to renew themselves and we have to be able to be more reflective, more critical of what we are doing. There are different statements, but I think what really clicked in my mind are two things. First is doing just a little bit more of what we are used to doing in the past decade is no longer enough. You know, we have to be able to look at things from a different perspective and then be able to embrace other realities. The second thing, I think also the, the statement that the tools of the 20th century are not always valid in the 21st century at the humanitarian level. We have to find other ways of doing things. And this basically comes from the good things we have done in many contexts. And the lessons we have learned, because everything we do sometimes might go partially, completely, or to tiny bit wrong, and we need to learn a little bit on how to do it better. Because what we do is, again, very important. It deals with massive levels of crisis in different countries. And hence, solution comes as one of the key votes that is being brought up at different levels. Everyone is asking us to be more solution-oriented, uh, uh, more forward-thinking. Uh, there are different ways of analyzing this, different ways of explaining that. Sometimes it could be within a very small level and sometimes can go for a very, very big level. When I was in Ukraine, we were discussing and one colleague said that, do you think that distributing NFI is not a solution? It is a solution. Well, actually, it could be a solution. It is a solution. but. Maybe there are different ways of, 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 uh, of um, reflecting on that one. So the exercise before we do, and I pass the, the table to the panels who will do the presentation, and as per your request, we will try to give more time for Q&A, and please prepare your questions. I don't want even to ask my guiding questions later on, but I want the hands to be up. I want three people in one sentence, only three, the first three who raise their hands to tell me in one sentence, what solution is for CCCM? Raise your hand. 
what solution is for CCCM? One hand up, please. Integration, integration, localization, return also. All right, so these are three words in one sentence. Thank you. Then I saw another hand, Vincent, there. Medium and long term vision is a solution as well as CCCM. The third and last one. Winning of IDPs from humanitarian dependence. Winning of IDPs from humanitarian dependence. It's the dependency has been one of the key things that we have to, as CCM in particular, we have to be thought about. Okay. Then the other question is quickly then one sentence for CCCM, what we do that could be not a solution. Let's be self-reflective. What we do that could be considered as not a solution. It might be a little bit not that good and we need to change. Hands up. Okay, so the same people, the same people, only three people. Hold on. Can I give the floor to the others to do those who did not, if you don't, if you allow? There's one here, then I will come there. Okay. One, two, the last one, please be ready to raise your hand. Despite our wish, we are creating the camp for short term solution, but which are not durable solution. It could be sometimes. If we are not thinking about the longer term, it might be a no solution approach. Then we will have one, and then the third hand, I will just turn my face now to see. But this is not always we may at the time create dependency syndrome by not adapting to new trends, changes in displacement context, etc. Not adapting, sometimes really, yeah, following the classical approach. Last one. Last one. No, I want someone else. Last hand. Come on. Yes, there's one in the end there, please. Yes, okay. Do you have a mic, please? If you have a mic, speak loud. We hear you, then I pass the floor to the colleagues. Uh, not building the bridges between the host communities and the IDPs. Important, not building the bridges between the host community and the IDPs. Even our family member is a, is a nice guest after three days, right? So we start thinking that we need to, to find other ways to, uh, to uh, build a, a peaceful coexistence together. So with that one, thank you very much for these answers. I hand the floor to first, Christina, to give us a valuable presentation for 10, 12 minutes. So we'll have enough time for later on for Q's and A's because I think this will be the most important part of it. So Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much there. I hope you can hear me and thank you to Van, to Roxy, to everyone else um, for this invitation. I have to say after being here for two days, I'm a bit uh, intimidated of the audience. Um, so, especially considering, I don't know if this thing, Charlie, I just, oh, okay. Considering the relationship between uh, DTM and, and CCCM, when even I started with DTM in 2015, 16, we were still part of, of DTM. And over period, as, as they mentioned, I had a really great experience working with CCCM colleagues from, from ACTED, DRC, obviously UNHCR, IOM in different countries. Um, the last one being South Sudan under the leadership of uh, Mr. Okello uh, and also working with Mahmoud. Um, so this presentation will be kind of to show all of you, um, let's say a DTM 3.0. Um, DTM had started in 2004 very closely with CCCM. Over the last 20 years, we, we grew, we evolved, and now with the, um, with the release of the action agenda, obviously we had to really keep up, as, as Natasha was now mentioning, we have to kind of follow the trends just to make sure that we deliver the data that we need uh, to put communities um, on solutions pathway. Is it's not really moving, Charlie. So by mentioning that action agenda, uh, just to place the, the, the process uh, kind of a bit of historically. So with the release of the, the action agenda, um, 
and the key three key elements that it brings uh in terms of the one being the to help to find the durable solution to to displacement dtm being iom's largest primary data collection system um really started thinking how best we can facilitate that as the as a data provider so within that um we partnered with our long standing partner georgetown university and decided we actually need to uh do a stock taking of what we're doing in different countries. At the time, it was around 100 countries and see what best we can offer to solutions partners. Um, meanwhile, another very key, very important document in this discussion is obviously Ask Review. I wasn't here on Monday, but people referenced that this was discussed. And here I put only two recommendations, the, I mean, the two priority recommendations from the document that uh, directly kind of advocate for humanitarian partners uh, and humanitarian community to start working a bit more on, on solutions uh, and start thinking long term how to how to get there and how to support communities to end their displacement related uh, vulnerabilities. So the result of this one year of our internal stock taking uh, consultations with partners uh, is the periodic global report on the state of solutions to internal displacement that we call progress um, that was done in partnership as i mentioned with the international um with the institute for the study of the international um, migration with georgetown university uh, and it's very much linked to the data for solution to internal displacement recommendation, which is a document kind of linking to the internal uh, recommendations on IDP statistics, with more operational uh, in nature that's trying to guide uh, resident coordinators offices uh, and country teams in gathering and maintaining databases that will have solutions relevant, uh, relevant data. So our approach is that we're very much people centered. Uh, we want to be operationally relevant. So this is very much in, in the spirit of DTM. Um, so on the one hand, it is working with the, with the government, which is what CCCM is doing a lot and trying to build in the statistical systems. But meanwhile, for us to implement programs, we obviously need um, operational data. In the first report, we focused on the 15 countries uh, of the, that were piloted under the UN Secretary General's agenda on solutions to internal displacement and the work of Robert Piper. But now, as we move on, we definitely will expand to different uh, to to other displacement operations around twenty around thirty where DTM is active, um, and I think most of them also then cover the areas where CCCM is active. It is twenty six or, or plus um, countries. Um, so the report itself, when we did the analysis, and I am very happy actually. So the next, I would just that I don't. Okay, uh, sorry. So I'm very happy to to hear that some of the findings from the report, or let's say key findings from the report, really resonate with what was discussed here yesterday and and today. Um, we're obviously very much in agreement. The solutions to start from the start. Um, what we uh, discussed there is that uh, there's a lot of discussion about when displacement ends, which is obviously a relevant question. Uh, and that we need to start when the solutions start uh, and start thinking about that. These are not mutually exclusive processes, as, as you all know. Um, it's not like humanitarian response ends and then solutions start. It's It really has to happen in parallel to have the biggest impact. Um, and then another... Um, Another thing that I would like to flag um, is the, and it came in the discussions today and yesterday, is really need for long-term funding for development investments. Um, obviously something that we're struggling, um, CCC in particularly, I think a reliance of three to six to nine months, um, you know, project cycles is really not uh, easy um, if you want to, to implement a long-term strategy. Um, and when we did the analysis, which was based on the MSNA data, and I know we have a few, I got it, uh, our colleagues from REACH here, um, we really noticed that there is a difference, um, that the displacement setting, and I've learned now, um, I'm not going to use CAMP, I'm going to use SITE, um, is an important factor for people when they make the decision or plans for their movement uh, intentions. So first of all, for the 15 countries that we analyzed, more than 50% of people were actually residing in camps, and that amounts to some 35, 36 million, um, 30 million people. 
uh, vulnerabilities in camps are different. Um, we've seen um, like the, the importance of shelter and importance of housing that also came in discussion before as one of the key 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 elements basically for I mean uh, setting up sorting out your basic needs obviously very much help in, in getting you uh, on the pathway to solution uh, as we call it. Um, so and also the the issue of social cohesion in terms of people who are living in camps and how they uh, work with the host community. Communities, uh, what is the relationship there? We had a very nice example from Somalia and the analysis that they're doing there in Baidoa and trying to, to see and understand better these relationships. So many of these things um, we try to address. I mean, we, we discussed in the report and tried to produce some uh, some recommendations. But I think the most important uh, for us as, as a DTM is basically that we come up with some operational recommendations for our data collection um, activities, how best we can support all of you uh, at the country level. Um, so the first one um, is to increase the availability of household level data. I think this, this comes very naturally, but I'm not talking here about um, having a very comprehensive household level survey. I'm talking about uh, complementing key informant assessments with the short household level questionnaires that are cheap to, to implement. There was an issue of cost also with any kind of intention household surveys or different surveys. Um, but the, the point is to better understand the demographics uh, of the of the displaced communities, um, especially what we've seen. And we did this in few countries in in Somalia, doing now in in Ethiopia. We successfully implemented where we collected demographic information on on 160,000 households. Um, and in other countries, and what you see is like the prominence of some population groups such as youth, which are often neglected in programming uh, and can be a very important, um, let's say, power, and not, not, not the right word, but it can be a very important population group for, for really building uh, resilience of the communities. Um, the second part is um, we do a lot of, obviously, surveys together with partners is really to try to align the indicators uh, across the countries. So to be able for advocacy level to do comparative analysis between different, like we did with progress uh, between different countries, but it's also to have um, you know, better understanding of similar uh, phenomena between different countries. And we work closely at the global level with REACH colleagues, for example, using the MSNA as a well-established well humanitarian process, data collection, to plug in a durable solution module um, uh, there. Um, it's also um, then trying try to look how best we can support different area-based based approaches that also were mentioned very much um, in, in the last two days with the tailored with specific surveys. Um, so we're talking about return reintegration surveys, uh, fragility uh, surveys, we have a return and I mean, solutions and mobility index and so on. And the last one um, is again linked to the DSID, um, which is basically to facilitate the coordination together with partners at the country level in bringing together humanitarian development, transition recovery partners to discuss the data and data gaps and data needs. Um, Obviously, humanitarian coordination and data is not ideal, but at least exists. Um, we don't have a similar thing for um, for solutions. We don't have necessarily, and someone mentioned, I think, Vincent or someone in, in a group before, um, that even for this kind of forum, it would be good to have someone speaking from the development side. Is it, I don't know, UN Habitat, UNDP, but to get these actors to, to talk to us on what their information gaps and needs are. At the global level, we're trying to do this um, with the with Asian Development Bank, with multilateral banks and, and uh, World Bank and so on. It's a very slow process because there, it requires a mind shift uh, from them to to start considering the impact of displacement as a broader, that displacement has an impact on broader communities, not just 76 million IDPs um, currently, um, but that it, 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 it really has impact on the society as a whole, um, uh, host communities and all other affected communities. Um, so this is effort, let's say, at a global level that we, we are working together with the UNDP, with, with, uh, with IDMC, with, with IMPACT and with uh, UNHCR, obviously, um, and um, trying really to find what are the ways how we can engage. This is a slow process, but it's, it's kind of uh, happening. 
um, and we hope to see some moves uh, towards um, it by the by the end of this year, especially as kind of this work is very much linked to the work of the special advisor on solutions, Robert Piper, and there will be some recommendations on how structures at the country level and the UN missions together with, with partners um, should should work together to address this, this challenge. Um, so, and this is then, and I'm going to close it here. I think I'm less than, than 10 minutes. Um, this is where we're going to, uh, where, where we're going to do it. I just want to, um, make it very clear that this is the work that I'm presenting here, um, is not that new in, in DTM. DTM is a kind of need driven system. So we work what partners identify to address the gaps that are identified by partners and by the authorities. Um, so this work has been ongoing at the country level, but we're trying really to, to kind of make a global framework to align things that are happening at hoc uh, in different places. And it's not in any case to replace DTM in humanitarian. This is just upgrading um, to, to, to facilitate, as I said, you know, solutions discussions from the start as we're talking about them. We need to know what data we, we need to collect. Um, this map is not super up to date. We're missing there Ethiopia. And I know we have colleagues here from Ethiopia that are doing a great job in, in Tigray uh, with some parity assessments um, and also Yemen. Um, so apologies for that if anyone noticed. Uh, and I think I'm going to end here there. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. So this was this was um, less than than ten minutes. Uh, amazing. Um, and uh, among many many things we are learning from from this uh, in depth presentation and holistic, covering many countries, but also not only humanitarian, as you said, feeding longer term planning and i think there is more appetite by the development actors as well now to um finally uh, see the importance of this and i think data has always and uh, needs to be seen not as a technical thing but more as strategic tool it is a very very strategic tool with this um i will um allow myself to hand the floor to our next speaker andrew who has thankfully made time within his busy schedule to come here and to give us a very very useful presentation on how durable solution works yes uh, thank you very much um and thank you for the organizers uh for inviting me and i hope you will invite me uh, again uh Lusandra, uh despite the mini heart attack uh she mm -hmm. thought that she lost me during the uh, the presentation so she was running around looking for me um, so my name is Andrew Maina. Um, I work with the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat. Um, REDS, as we call it in short, is a platform uh, formed by 14 NGOs working within uh, the Great Lakes Horn of Africa and the um, Great Lakes Horn of Africa and the wider, uh, yeah, Horn of Africa includes East Africa, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, apologies. When uh, when I have very limited time um, and I'm under pressure, I tend to speak very fast. So if it's uh, I'm going too fast, you can just do this, and then I'll uh, I can pace myself. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah. So Reds um, as a platform uh, was formed by these 14 NGOs to work um, on solutions um, in the Great Lakes region um, in the Horn of Africa that also includes East Africa. Um, our work mainly revolves around uh, research uh, analysis, uh, supporting our members to uh, assimilate some of the research that uh, is being produced, um, such as the one that uh, Katrina has mentioned here. Um, also uh, developing um, content around capacity development to ensure that whatever information that is coming out is also applied, and also engaging or supporting our members to engage in policy discussions. Uh, we call it policy dialogue or policy influence. Um, so. So I think I've covered that. So basically, um, my presentation is, um, uh, in short, covers two uh, major questions. Um, the larger question is around how CCM partners can better facilitate solutions. Uh, and again, the point is better facilitate solutions because uh, by and large, you are contributing to solutions, even with the work that you do currently. Um, so how then, what, what are some of those considerations that you can look at, um, you know, to better look at um, uh, sol facilitate solutions? And two things, um, because of the interest of time, I'll focus on two major points. One is around understanding, a better understanding of the problem uh, as far as solutions is concerned. Um, if you're talking about durable solutions, then what is the problem? Um, and then how do we better integrate contextual factors into our uh, response? 
I think some of the things that you hear, again, are not going to be new. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned, but just a way of um, um, sort of how do we uh, sort of conceptualize it and how do we apply it in the real world. Now, in terms of durable solutions, how, uh, sorry. So in terms of how durable solutions has been defined in the past, um, it has, uh, the definition has always focused on the outcome. So when you hear about durable solutions, you always hear that it is when displacement affected communities uh, no longer have um, uh, protection and assistance needs and can access their rights without discrimination. But then that is part of the story. There's a wider issue here when you talk about solutions. So solutions, uh, first and foremost, must be understood as a process, um, a process that is political, a process that is nonlinear, a process that is long term. Um, so that is my first point. Second point, within that process, the aim is gradually reducing displacement-specific needs, while at the same time uh, promoting or restoring access to rights for the displaced population. And to be able to do that, you are addressing four major challenges. One is the human rights challenge of restoration of these rights. The second is the humanitarian challenge, which I think all of you are quite familiar with. Uh, the third is a development challenge. How do we ensure IDPs are not left behind while others progress um, you know, against the um, uh, sustainable development goal agenda? And the last one is around peace building, which is stabilization, political, social, and economic. And you can see from that uh, definition, it is a much wider scope that involves a wider uh, conversation with a wider set of actors um, in the different sectors and the different um, uh, you know, locations that uh, implement. And then the other one is around when does this thing begin? It begins from the onset. I think um, the point was made about solutions from the beginning. So at the outset, during the emergency situations or cases, that is when we need, we, we need to be started. We need to start to think about solutions. And it ends when IDPs achieve that sustainable reintegration. Again, that reintegration can be achieved either in the place of origin, that means going for them to go back, or in the place where they've been displaced or in a different location. So those are all factors that need to be considered. But at the, at the end of it all, which is my last point there, they, that process must respect the rights of IDPs to voluntarily decide what they want to do, where they want to go, and that it must be you know, based on an informed choice. Um, and there has to be dignity um, and, and safety. So when you talk about um, uh, reintegration or sustainable integration, um, those are the sort of set, set of standards um, that have been outlined by the Interagency Standing Committee um, Durable Solutions Framework uh, that was published in 2010. And if you look at that, um, it also corresponds to um, certain elements of the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'll not go too much into this. So essentially, when somebody says that they have achieved, or we say that somebody has achieved a durable solution, they ought to have at least achieved the first four. Uh, given that that is most com uh, uh, most applicable in non contexts, and then the other four, the last four is might vary depend on um, specific context. So, for instance, in Somalia, um, family reunification may not be a good indicator of durable solutions, given that families willfully displace um, to sort of create a wider network where they can be able to expand and diversify their livelihood opportunities. Right. So, how does that uh, look like um, in sort of practice? So we have the goal there at the very end um, that we are all trying to achieve. Um, we are all trying to achieve sustainable integration where IDPs no longer have those um, uh, protection and assistance needs and they can access their rights without discrimination. Um, and to be able to do that, we need to address those four challenges and we need to respond to those four challenges based on those, uh, you know, the points that have outlined there around restoration of rights, around um, elevating suffering and saving lives, around ensuring that IDPs are not left behind uh, when it comes to development uh, dividends and benefits, and ensuring that um, you know we work on um, uh, sustainability or stability of, of these locations. But then that is also not the full story. Um, we implement in contexts, right? Which is my next, uh, the next point there. And in that context, there are certain elements that would either prevent or sort of um, uh, slow down the progress towards solution. So this is what we call, we are calling internally some political, economic, uh, and social barriers towards solution. Um, the politics, um, where we implement, um, uh, particularly where the sites are, decisions about where sites are, are not necessarily very uh, humanitarian, if I can call them that. They are political undertones. They are people. They are decisions that are being made. They are incentives um, that um, sort of um, uh, facilitate um, um, key decisions about where to place uh, IDPs, about you know what, who has access to them, and why. 
Um, the, the other one is around the social barriers. There are elements around marginalization. Um, in places where IDPs exist, you will see that there's a sort of social stratification and IDPs uh, in most cases are not have very limited access to rights and decision-making processes. So to what degree are we actually addressing, even as we engage with the technical aspects of uh, durable solutions, how are we engaging with those um, significant um, uh, contextual barriers? And then the economies of it. I think that the, the major problem with um, or the major um, sort of challenge within the uh, humanitarian space is reducing um, the so-called dependency. Um, but that uh, you need to step back and ask yourself, um, you know, to what extent are we replicating things or are we sort of supplanting local strategies? Are we really engaging in, you know, what is already existing in these locations where we we uh, we, we support IDPs? Um, and, you know, are we doing more harm than good in a way that, you know, will prolong um, 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 sort of um, uh, dependencies? Right. So. So those are the issues. So what then can we be able to do here? Um, again, um, very quickly. Within the durable solution space, there are this there are um, a set of uh, key factors or key principles uh, that actors have been using. So I am summarizing those in those in those four points um, and sort of grouping them together. Um, so one is area based, which I think is quite familiar with everyone in this room, given that uh, you know uh, site um, uh, management um, is a clear exercise of area based approach. Um, the other one is people centeredness. Um, the other one is around uh, a collective and comprehensive approach. And the last one is politically smart approaches. So in terms of the people-centered approach, I think the key thing um, here is to understand is the key uh, issue here is to um, create, in, uh, create um, sort of interventions that support people to support themselves. Having that mentality that these individuals need to be able, after a certain period of time, we need to be able to sort of, um, uh, you know, brick by brick, support them gradually to be able to overcome displacement vulnerabilities in a way that they can be able to sustain themselves without external in um, intervention. Um, and in that case, that looks at the needs, rights, and the legitimate interest of these IDPs. Um, it also addresses the key issues around marginalization, uh, who is marginalized and why, and how do we ensure that that is also integrated into the um, into how we uh, operate um, in the different sites. The last one is um, around meaningful participation, and uh, allow me to be a bit controversial. It goes beyond uh, community feedback systems, right? It goes to the heart of allowing IDPs to be able to set their agenda, to be able to review their agenda, to be able to call you as external actors and question what you have you have or have not done, and how that aligns to their interests uh, and um, uh, interests and priorities. Um, that in itself will provide them a space where they can be, you know, can be able to bring out what they feel is, um, you know, what they feel that they can do themselves, and where they think that the external actors can be able to support them. The other one is around uh, area-based approaches, and here is around really understanding about what resources are available and who has access to those resources and how decisions about those resources are made. Um, I like the point around um, engaging not only, or rather, focusing on the whole of the population, looking at IDPs, but also looking at the host community surrounding the IDPs. That's a good point. But also looking at the environment. Um, it, there's a bit of a balance between the demands, which is a lot of where um, a lot of the information and data is consumed is around demands. What do they need? Where, you know, uh, how much do they have in, and so on. But then what about the, the context? What, what is available? What resources are available? Um, you know, is, is land available for them if they want to farm? Is, are the natural uh, resources available for them? Uh, and so on and so forth. What is the physical infrastructure in such a location? I think those two things have to um, really uh, uh, interact with each other for us to really think, um, for us to be actually contributing or facilitating solutions. Um, then the last two points. Um, um, the other one is around uh, politically smart approach. Um, originally, it's framed as government-led um, approaches, but different um, different uh, displacements uh, you know varies in different contexts so there are contexts in which you have a very strong government a government that is responsive a government that is you know available but then in certain um, circumstances uh, you would find that um, you know there is government that is in contestation such as what you know the, the 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 conversation that is happening in sudan you know who has authority over where and so on so the idea here is to ensure that we understand what um, engaging with the politics of the context, understand what the incentives are, understand the interests, understand the actors. What do they want out of this? Um, given that you know a lot of the um, conversations, particularly in the humanitarian space, go towards 
um, uh, aid diversion. And to some degree, that diversion is based on a very, um, you know, that corrupt sort of, you know, agenda or intent. But in other, in other situations, it essentially is around elites and elite bargaining. And without having an understanding of why certain things happen, why IDPs are put in certain locations and not others, why there's a certain camp that is not serviced and not others, we're not likely going to uh, move the needle on, on, on solutions any further. So that really requires an understanding of informal and formal governance structures, yes, um, and that incentive um, uh, understanding. And also engaging, having engagement plans that are based on political realities. Then lastly, I think this goes without saying, this is exactly the work that um, CCCM does, coordination, engaging with all actors, uh, even the ones that don't want to be engaged um, uh, is quite critical. So let me let me pause there. End there. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Engaging with all actors. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think um, first it's really useful for us and enlightening to know that there are actors like you whom we can come to with questions. Thanks also for. Uh, for enlightening us to tell that we must do it, it must be done at all stages, and also for underlining that there are lots of difficulties related to political issues that we are facing on a daily basis, but nothing that will make us give up on uh, on embedding solutions in our uh, daily work. Um, now, I would like to give the floor to uh, Miranda, who is dialing in from uh, Kiev. Uh, Miranda, please a quick sound test, and uh, then the floor is yours. Do you hear us first of all? We cannot. Oh, I, I shared my screen, and my my audio button disappeared. But so I'm I'm with you. I can hear you, um, and then I'll share my screen again if that's okay. Oops, I think that's the wrong. We hear you loud and clear, Miranda. Okay, great. Can you see my presentation? Yes, now we can see it on this full screen. Perfect. It's on full screen. Okay, great. So, um, colleagues, thank you very much uh, for inviting me today, and I do regret that I can't be there with you. Um, we do have two colleagues, though, um, from the cluster, as well as other CCCM partners from Ukraine um, who are there. Uh, joining you in Nairobi. Um, so today we're going to speak a little bit about the work that's being done by CCCM partners in Ukraine, um, supporting uh, people living in collective sites to link with solutions. And I think we'll start just quickly um, with a bit of context um, because, well, we like to say that our context is very unique, but I do think that there are quite a few similarities that we'll find um, between other operations as well. So just to go back to February 2022, and this was at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, um, this was a mass displacement of millions of people, some who stayed displaced within Ukraine, others who went and became refugees in neighboring countries. During the first uh, couple months of this period, it was estimated that there were up to 7,000 collective sites that were established to accommodate people displaced and on the move. And it's probably worth saying here that in Ukraine, we don't have camps. Um, we have what we call collective sites, which are basically temporary shelters um, for people that are established in dormitories, kindergartens, community centers, and so on. Um, by the end of the year, the number of people living in those collective sites had stabilized um, at around 116,000 across 3,700 collective sites in the country. Um, that increased, or sorry, decreased slightly by the end of last year to about 111,000 in 2,500 collective sites. And now we've just finished doing a verification process um, of sites across the country, and we have reduced the overall population um, of people living in collective sites to about 85,000 people across 2,380 sites, about 1,900 which are currently actively hosting. And what's important about this is that within the broader scope of internal displacement, in Ukraine, this is a relatively small percentage. It's about 3% of displaced people. Um, but it's important to remember that most IDPs within Ukraine 
are, you know, they, they have rented apartments, they have their jobs, they're going about their daily lives in their situation of displacement. Um, people who are remaining currently in the collective sites are considered largely to have high vulnerabilities and for one reason or another um, are not able or sometimes willing um, to leave the collective site. So what we're seeing now um, is that almost 80% of IDPs residing in collective sites have been there for at least one and a half years or more. Um, and in terms of the presence of vulnerabilities, 91% of sites um, host older women and 80% host older men. Um, about 62% host people with disabilities and 15% of sites host people with chronic illnesses. Now, there is about a 43% working age population, but among them, the level of employment is quite low at 35%. So within this broader context, we see uh, more than two years on now that there's very much a strong need for linking people with solutions. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit about how we have been approaching this through uh, evidence-based approaches, area-based approaches, uh, supporting community-led initiatives, collaborations with other sectors, and then finally advocacy. Um, so to give you a little bit of a context, this is our, our latest heat map in terms of the locations of collective sites across the country. You can see on the right hand side, so to the east and south of the country, the red area, which is the, the frontline conflict affected areas. Um, and you'll notice a very significant concentration of collective sites in the west. Um, while all of Ukraine is to an extent impacted by the war, these areas in the east are very much the frontline um, acute conflict areas, so to speak. Um, and so when you look at this, we see that very much we're focusing when we speak about durable solutions or solutions in general, I don't like the term durable in this context necessarily, um, but that we're focusing very much on the central and western parts of the country um, in the work that we've been doing on solutions. So first is speaking about an evidence-based analysis and planning. Um, we do conduct um, in coordination, uh, in collaboration with REACH, um, our regular collective site monitoring. But in addition to that, uh, last year, there was a durable solutions analysis briefs, which were area-based evaluations around progress towards local integration um, for people living in collective sites in four different locations. Um, I think perhaps something to mention here also is that there is quite a significant focus when talking about solutions in local integration. And the reason behind this is for many people living in collective sites, either their homes are completely destroyed and they can't return to them, or their home communities are in frontline areas where it is incredibly dangerous to return, or they might now be uh, under the occupation of the Russian Federation. So um, we'll see that there's a lot of focus on local integration, but not exclusively. Um, something that became very apparent, and this goes back to the point that was made before about household level um, assessments is that we um, partners have been looking into being able to identify very specifically at the household or individual level the needs and opportunities for solutions and this is enabled to support people with more tailored ways of accessing better accommodation um, and better integrating into their communities and sort of going on with their lives in a situation that is not dependent on humanitarian assistance. Um, so I think IOM in the case of collective site profiling really sort of led the charge on this to an extent um, and was conducting profiling across seven regions. Um, and it looked into everything from demographics and vulnerabilities, reasons for displacement, their intentions, do they want to go home? Um, you know, the conditions that would need to be in place for them to leave the collective sites, um, access to livelihood, social cohesion, and so on. Um, and all of this information together provides a much clearer picture in terms of the types of programming that is needed um, and the types of tailored assistance. And so um, we have our colleague Veronica from IOM who is there with you, so she can tell you a lot more about this. Um, but just to say that all of this falls within um, uh, IOM's Pathways Towards Solutions strategy, um, which talks a lot about targeted assistance for IDPs. And you'll see that this has become also um, an approach that we've taken on more broadly within the operation. 
Um, also around evidence-based analysis, we had at the end of last year an interagency joint data analysis workshop. Um, something that we are not lacking in Ukraine is data. Um, there's all kinds of data collection that happens across different sectors within the humanitarian and the development side. And what we decided was that we really needed to sit down with a variety of actors bring together the different data analysis and see how we can use that to support our understanding of what are the needs and formulate joint recommendations. So this was a workshop that took place in December. There were both humanitarian and development actors present. Um, and we were able to form some joint recommendations around access to employment and livelihoods, alternative housing and recommendations on social cohesion. So that report is available on our website. Um, what we have coming up um, in a partnership with REACH and the Protection Cluster is a wider vulnerability survey. So trying to understand um, how different types of vulnerabilities are perhaps presenting barriers or opportunities um, for people living in collective sites to find more suitable um, and sustainable alternative accommodation um, and specifically the types of assistance that they require um, in order to reach these solutions. And I think maybe we need to also say, again, going back to how I don't like the term durable solutions necessarily, um, because really this can just be you know, a medium term solution until someone is able to return home, which may still be a very long way away. Um, next, uh, to speak a little bit about the area based approaches for local integration, I think this approach might be familiar um, to some colleagues. Um, but the idea, of course, is to facilitate linkages uh, with local services, local markets, livelihoods, basically making sure that we are not creating parallel systems for people that are displaced and living in collective sites, but rather bringing existing services. And, you know, in Ukraine, we have a very well-established system of social services and social assistance. It's under great strain right now because of the war, but it does still exist. Um, and being able to connect people with those available services. So um, as an example, we have a local partner uh, called the Integration Center and in Rivna, they have set up such a center as a physical hub, which facilitates access um, for uh, IDPs, both in collective sites and outside of collective sites, as well as the local population. Um, so they can access information, referrals to services, um, a whole variety of services, including legal, medical, vocational training, access to social housing programs, and so on. Um, and what's interesting is that it also serves a bit as a community space. So it brings in civil society organizations, volunteers, businesses, and it's also used by government entities. Um, so it serves a little bit this uh, sort of social cohesion aspect and promotion of linkages between IDPs and the local community. Um, there's also the aspect of promoting self-organization of IDP committees and representative associations um, and supporting their involvement and in linkages with civil society groups and IDP councils, um, as well as these community feedback mechanisms to help improve trust in public institutions um, through being able to voice concerns and participate in the decision-making of local governance and service delivery. Um, and so as an example, we have NRC who are operating in Western Ukraine, um, who are facilitating site representative associations. Now, of course, the focus is also on management of the site and mobilization of people living within the site. So it is inward focused, but it is also outwardly focused in terms of engaging people um, with local IDP councils, um, which are becoming quite strong in Ukraine, um, as well as linkages with civil society groups to help strengthen that aspect of local integration. Integration. And the idea being, of course, that when people are more connected with the local community, it then facilitates them being able to leave that collective site um, and live in uh, more suitable accommodation options. Um, we also have community-led initiatives. These are small, uh, small-scale local initiatives. Um, and so in terms of uh, yeah, so in terms of supporting these community-led initiatives, the idea is to promote social cohesion as well as local integration. 
Um, it's based on consultations with the collective site residents, IDPs, as well as local communities to identify what might be the needs and the interests um, of these groups, so to speak, um, and how different initiatives can be pulled together um, to support this. So as an example, we have our local partner, um, a national organization called Rakata, um, who is working to support community-led initiatives. Um, there's one, we have the microgreens initiative and the greenhouse initiative, but I'll, I'll skip to the next one quickly. Um, collaboration with other sectors for solutions. And this one is becoming so, so important for us. And this goes back to what I was saying about the uh, sort of case management approach, individualized approach. And we work particularly closely with protection, shelter and livelihoods. Um, sh protection really supports on taking on the case management aspects um, as well as household level support. Um, shelter uh, really facilitates on linkages to repair assistance, so people whose homes are damaged, and if the homes can be repaired, they can return to those homes, um, as well as integrated rental market initiatives where it is appropriate. Um, and finally, livelihoods, of course, connecting people with livelihoods opportunities, as well as reskilling, um, because the job market is very different in different parts of Ukraine. Um, so UNHCR and Medair have a collaboration on this. Um, they actually supported 617 households across three oblasts. Um, and 23 collective sites with such an integrated program. Um, advocacy and linkages with recovery initiatives. Now, I think we perhaps had been under the impression that the development actors would magically appear and we would somehow be just handing over um, activities to development actors who would be able to support local social services and so on. That hasn't necessarily happened and we've had to be a lot more proactive in our advocacy and trying to draw linkages um, with this. And so um, our, we've had to enhance our coordination with recovery and development actors, both in terms of data and planning, um, and also at both national and local government level, basically to make sure that the residents of collective sites are not left behind. There's a lot of planning going on around Build Back Better in Ukraine, and we try to make sure always to voice the importance of including people in collective sites so that they can be part of this process. Um, as an example, we have a 12 Hromada, which is sort of local, uh, local government pilot initiative um, jointly with uh, different UN and NGO uh, humanitarian development actors um, with local governments on area-based approaches to recovery um, and are engaging very proactively to make sure that IDPs and collective sites are part of this process. And as a final note, because um, I know I'm running out of time, um, I think it's just important to emphasize here that solutions are not happening within a vacuum. So we are still in a situation very much of flux. Um, there is a process going on of site closure and consolidation, and we are in parallel working to ensure that site closure follows principled and do no harm uh, approaches. And while it does present risks, it also presents an opportunity because it is a point of engagement with people to provide them with very targeted and individualized support to help make sure that they don't just move to another collective site, but that they're able to you know, move on to more appropriate options. Um, there is also uh, ongoing discussion around drawdown and exit strategies in the West and central parts of Ukraine. So areas where we don't necessarily have that acute um, conflict ongoing. Um, and that of course impacts our approaches as well as funding. Um, and finally, we still have, and this has been um, escalating as well in recent weeks, um, new displacement and evacuations from frontline areas and border areas. And so this actually is very much for us a point of trying to engage in the solutions from the start approach and taking some of the lessons learned that we um, have acquired from our work in the West and seeing how we can then translate that into a more proactive solutions approach for newly displaced people um, in the East. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, this was a, a practical example uh, from, from a country where we operate. And I think among many other things we have learned how the different actors are joining their forces to work together and also how different clusters are also getting together to do the dual solution and also that even in a place where we have uh, uh, some 
more funding, let's say, it's still there are many challenges. A solution is still yet to be uh, considered as one of the biggest uh, challenges that we are experiencing. So now, with these three presentations, we have reached the end of the of the of the presentation part of the session. As we said, we are going to skip the group activity and we will move straight away to uh, Q and A and the, and the, and the inputs from the group. Um, I was um, advised to prepare some questions to ask, but I just really do that because sometimes we don't have hands raised immediately, so it's just to warm up the group. But I give now five seconds if someone wants really to spare me asking some prepared questions that I have, and then you just take the floor yourselves. Who would like to? There we go. Good. The floor is yours. Do you have a mic? Because I think it will be easier for Miranda to hear us as well. And um, I will direct the questions to each panelist to answer. I think it's easier just to go one after another, mm -hmm. unless if you want to name the panel member that you want to ask. But go ahead. The floor is yours, please. No. Th thank you, Dare, and the panelists. Uh, very informative uh, session, I will say. Uh, my name is Abdi Gure. I'm a system cluster coordinator for Sudan Response. So two questions specifically to Andrew and also to Christina. Uh, to Andrew, um, you mentioned politically smart being an approach that the REDS is considering. I wonder how does the work of REDS speak to the ongoing effort of intergovernmental authority for development, the African Union, um, East African community integration uh, policies? I would like to hear more um, how basically this, the effort of the 14 NGOs or INGOs in the Horn of Africa is speaking to the existing effort um, within the governmental authorities in the region. And then second question to Christina, uh, you mentioned one of the initiatives uh, between DTM and ISIM. You mentioned uh, objective avoiding overlaps as well as redundancy but also you mentioned solution from the start requires developmental funding. I wonder how the DTM ISIM initiative is speaking to existing country level data, um, you know, uh, for instance, from the World Bank, uh, you know, identifying structural gaps, whether it's political gaps, uh, you know, economical as well as population movement. So it will be interesting as well to see in this upgrade by DTM, uh, how this data is actually speaking to existing country level data that's available provided by developmental partners. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Grace. So maybe we will go for another question. Let's see, because you already asked two questions. So one, two, three, moving from here based on the hands raised, and then we will go for a round of answers by the colleagues. Don't forget that sometimes Give also the advantage to Miranda, she's online. So if you are going to address who the question is to, also please imagine that Miranda is also there uh, online with us still. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for the presentations. It's informative. So my question is for Christina. Uh, we have frequently emphasized uh, the CCM cluster solutions and strategies for the camps during the meetings. However, I believe uh, the answer uh, may lie in the findings uh, of those assessments under the DTM. Therefore, uh, have you conducted specific intention assessment or exit strategy for IDPs in both IDP sites and newly arrived to the reception centers? Uh, if so, what were the different findings? By the way, this is Tamam from CCM Cluster Syria. Thank you, uh, Tamam. I think we can go for one more question. If anybody has a question directed to Miranda, so we will not give, you know, the, the only, we, oh, I'm sure there are many questions, but just the priority, if you have any question to Miranda, or I will, I will. Uh, My, mine's uh, kind of more open. Open, so this will be Miranda's question then. Okay, uh, Miranda. Uh, hi, this is Adam from IOM Somalia. Um, when we take the IDMC figures, it, it's, it leans very heavily into conflict-related displacement and kind of sudden onset crises, disasters. But then there's a whole wealth of people if we just consider the extensive rapid urbanization globally. I mean, we're sat on the fastest, uh, most rapidly urbanizing continent there is. Many of those people whom do travel to cities 
do so because of economic reasons. But if you scratch away the surface, it's often linked to the need to adapt to diversify income generation. And it's often linked to slow impact protracted climate crises. So I'm just curious, you know, where do, do those persons sit within the solutions landscape? Um, and, and given that they carry many of the similar vulnerabilities as conflict related or, or maybe sudden impact disasters, how we, you know, what's their future basically? Thank you, good question. So maybe now we will start um, handing the floor again back to the panelists to answer the questions. So I would I would like to first start with Christina. You were asked two questions, I believe. And uh, well, um, yeah, well, you know. And then um, Andrew and then Miranda. So Christina, please take the floor. Thanks a lot um, there. And thank you thanks for questions, um, Abdi Guri, if I got it right. Um, so the first version of this report that we produced last year wasn't really looking much into um, other data sources, what you mentioned, and the World Bank. Uh, one of the things, one of the so first reason for that was um, that we wanted to demonstrate that existing operational data that is being vastly collected, and Miranda was talking also about Ukraine having a lot of data, can be used uh to provide solutions analysis even though if it was not designed necessarily for that um we're talking about is criteria iris sub criteria um and there is a lot of in existing multi-sectoral assessments that we can learn about it so that was kind of the idea so we use the msna and we use the different dtm surveys that have been conducted at the household level the emphasis was on household level but also on the key informant assessments that we had so that was kind of, let's say, the agenda of the first report. Uh, another reason is also that um, a lot of um, data from, from World Bank for the 15 countries that we had, including statistical data from the authorities, was not really available nor up to date. So the 15 countries that were piloted under action agenda uh, had quite a turbulent, let's say, past 10, 15 years, if not more, um, where you don't really have um, a very relevant, because we're talking about displacement context uh, quite recently. So we were looking at 2022 data, early 2023, and you can't always find um, a relevant data for that period uh, because obviously censuses have been not been conducted in many areas, even if there are some estimates, um, you know, you, you have some doubts about it, or is data not necessarily available at that level? Um, we are trying to address that in this round for, the, for this report and working with the Georgetown University to identify some of the additional sources, because um, that is that should be the goal to try to overcome that gap. Um, so on the one hand, demonstrate the potential of operational data while we set up the statistical systems, but also try to find the bridge uh, between uh, the development sources and humanitarian to the extent possible. Um, and then on the on the question from from colleague from Syria, sorry, I didn't um, capture the name. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the, the question, um, but let me give an answer to what I kind of got. So we are doing, I mean, this question will probably be better answered by people at the country level. Uh, we do have multiple surveys, intention surveys that have been conducted in different settings. I know Syria is a bit of a sensitive um, place to, to operate. Um, so one of the things is, um, and we do monitor also in, in camps, for example, as I was working before in South Sudan, we had um, a daily basically data collection activities in big, big camps to um, understand the movement and to understand where people are going for how long they're absent. Uh, and that gives you an indication of, let's say, the flow, the population. Um, but it also gives you these tricky, it gives you insights into these tricky moments where, um, as we used to say for one of the camps, you know, people are living one leg in the camp, one outside, because people are claiming their spot in the camp to access services because they are not available outside. Um, and secondly, they obviously still might have access to their land and they want to take care of their properties. Um, so I don't know if you had any specific, uh, but uh, 
kind of from the global level, what we want to do with this process now with ETM is try to consolidate um, the intention surveys, not just us alone. There is a group under Piper, uh, Robert Piper's um, office that's talking uh, about intention surveys. It's a very small group. Um, it's, it's a bit slow progress because it's a very complicated thing, um, a complicated issue. Um, but yeah, I think it would be probably better answer if we would have someone from country level um, to say direct examples. But I, I'm, I'm very sure that we, we do have. Andrew? Great. Um, thank you. Um, I'd be good for that question. Um, so to start off, it's um, one, we do engage with IGAD. And we do engage directly with ICGL app, which is a similar platform for the Great Lakes region. Um, we haven't uh, uh, been quite keen on engaging the AU yet, although that is a space that we want to look at. Um, and in terms of how to engage them, uh, again, we see these platforms as places where um, can provide some level of accountability or pressure to governments to be able to do what they ought you know, to do. But given that um, uh, a lot of these um, um, mechanism, peer review mechanisms are not necessarily, uh, do not necessarily provide that um, immediate pressure to move things along, um, it's sort of like um, a more long-term approach, uh, you know, we, we, we take to these things, uh, trying to support them to bring these governments together and discuss key issues. Uh, and the point there is around uh, ensuring that we have the data from the ground and ensuring that the conversations are actually context-based because the, the more regional, global things get, the more generic they become um, and the less the, the specificity of um, context you know, becomes dissolved. So we try to keep these conversations uh, as grounded as possible uh, while also at the same time um, trying to uh, use these um, platforms as um, locations where some level of accountability can uh, can be can be had and sustained. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Miranda, I hope you hear the question. Um, if you have, please take the floor to answer. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure to what extent I can speak about sudden impact disasters, but maybe on the point about people moving to urban areas, I think, um, you know, you're entirely right that people prioritize urban areas because of economic opportunities. In the case of Ukraine, it's also very much where people go to seek services um, because it's just easier in large urban areas to be able to get what you need, um, to be able to register children in school, find jobs and so on. Um, but I think we also need to be reflecting upon ourselves and the ways in which we provide assistance and um, you know in camp situations this can be quite different but if we're talking about you know broader displacement outside of camps um, there does tend to be a focus on providing assistance in the easiest areas to access or at least that's what we see here and so um, urban areas, larger cities, um, is where we tend to see a concentration of humanitarian assistance. Um, but also part of what I have found to be so interesting from a CCCM perspective is this very heavy focus in Ukraine on collective sites. And I think it's because in part, it's a very easy place. You go to the collective site and you know that you will find IDPs. And so I don't want to say necessarily that, um, you know, we're being lazy, but I think that we need to think about ways that we can step outside of our own comfort zones a little bit as humanitarians and think about ways that we can better cater the assistance to people, um, not always in necessarily the urban centers and because you know it doesn't mean that they have to be living in the middle of nowhere there's there's a bit of a middle ground and i think we just need to be very conscious of that um when it comes to supporting people with services um in large urban areas thank you thank you miranda we will move to the next round of questions but just just to to to, to a word of warning that i i really feel that the life is too short to answer all these questions for good reasons because i think we we have lots of um, uh, curiosity and we want to learn, and this is very much relevant to our work. So um, we have still 23 minutes, but then I start from this side and move to that. So one, I think there was one question here, two, three. Come on, Thank please. you. Jeff. So my name is uh, Conrad, uh, South Sudan CCCM Cluster Coordinator. Mine is not a question, but just a comment or reflection. 
uh, but uh, thank you to all uh, three panelists. But uh, my reflection is on Andrew's presentation. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for unpacking to us the EASC uh, criteria for durable solutions. No? And uh, the realization that's sunk in is that as a CCCM cluster, we can, yes, we can only facilitate, no? We can only be a bridge or a gateway, but not the destination, which is durable solution. And uh, I thank you, Andrew, for reminding us not to be naive, you know, in, you know, facilitating solutions, but uh, to be politically, socioeconomically, and legally smart, you know, as we support the displaced uh, population. So again, uh, CCCM can only be a gateway or a bridge through um, community engagement, data for solution, and, and partnerships. We cannot tinker with, I guess, durable solutions. We cannot be the destination, but just a gateway or a bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, uh, Mohammed El Hadi. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, linked to his uh, Piper initiative uh, in Nigeria is uh, among the countries, and they launched uh, the initiative last week or this week. It's almost uh, $3 billion for a solution. And from my perspective, when we are working as humanitarian, there is big gap between this solution and the development and humanitarian. So my question to you, and uh, in general, how we link, because most of those solutions, especially in Nigeria, are supposed to be in the areas that need the humanitarian activities in one way or another. So my question to you, how that uh, the collaboration and coordination in that way is supposed to be done? Because I give an example, like UNHCR colleagues that working for the solution, they don't have any link with the others that look working for a CCCM or shelter and those kind of things. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, and then another question from the other end of the table, and then we'll go to the back to the panelists to answer the questions. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my name is Asadullah. I'm from Afghanistan. Um, many displaced populations uh, that particularly in Afghanistan, have been in protracted displacement, uh, like for years, even decades. Uh, my question is, like, how can CCCM programming uh, shift from care and maintenance uh, approach to, uh, to an approach that truly facilitates uh, the durable solutions for particularly protracted displacements? Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this question. Um, so again, I think we'll go with the same rhythm, if that's okay, um, if you allow, because the, the second question anyhow was um, addressed to you, Andrew. So, uh, Christina, maybe you answer the first, and then Andrew, and then uh, Chimuanda on the last care and maintenance question, I think it's also very much um, operations relevant, so. So I think first was more of a comment from Conrad um, on, yeah, what CCCM's role should be in the, in in the durable solutions um, efforts uh, and acting as a bridge. Um, but maybe I can just start based on, on Muhammad's um, point on, on Nigeria. I'm not obviously um, expert for, for Office of Special Advisor and Solutions. Um, but what um, I can talk maybe from the data perspective, for example, and I think thinking then of Kundad and how work was done in South Sudan uh, for one of the camps, shows is a good example of how um, development, um, assume peace building, transition recovery and humanitarians can, can work together. Um, they do probably come disjointed. Um, and I think it, this disjointment is very much visible in, in the data sphere, um, where you would have assessments group that are focusing only on severity, on prioritization, very much humanitarian. It's not easy to break this uh, break this bubble. Um, but I think with the, the, the good thing about solutions, um, I mean, not good thing, the, the key 
um, element with the solutions is that this is not an emergency response, that solutions require long-term planning. And with long-term planning, uh, every piece of the, this holistic approach should have its own space. Like there's a two, three years plan that has to be developed. The role, role, role of data has to be properly designed. Is it at the beginning? What do you want to know at the end or in the process? Um, and the, 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 obviously, as I said, like before, it's not mutually exclusive. Humanitarian needs are obviously very high. We were talking about uh, also IDPs and host communities that offer often uh, both in very living in very challenging uh, conditions. Um, but I think, and one thing why that probably is happening, at least from my perspective, is that we still have don't have solid funding mechanisms that can uh, facilitate the joint work of humanitarian and development. So it's either or. Um, I'm going back to South Sudan again because that was the, the place where I worked before. It was literally like that. You had a country divided where SSHF or South Sudan Humanitarian Fund would, in, would provide funding. And we had another set of counties where we had the World Development Bank. Both had different, and the whole country had severe humanitarian need because of the infrastructure. But it was literally divided like that. So probably... There is a need, and I feel that there is a bit of a shift at the global level, at least uh, I think from the BHA and our conversations with them, that they're more open to thinking about solutions and not moving, and even ECHO moving from purely life-saving towards a bit more resilient solution um, um, project uh, activities. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge, um, obviously, but yeah, I think... Yeah, we just need to be aware of it and then start to see how we can um, combine it better. I hope that helps. Thank you, Christina. Andrew. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Conrad, I think uh, I don't want to dilute anything. Um, uh, I think everything you've said is uh, quite accurate. But then one last tagline, uh, because this will not be a humanitarian gathering without a tagline, um, is that um, it's contribution, not attribution. Um, we we contribute towards solutions. No one entity can be able to achieve it. So we have to work together to be able to do that. We look at the different sectors, we look at the different approaches uh, that we need to uh, engage. Um, a colleague from uh, Af Afghanistan. Um, yes, so in, in terms of a shift from care and maintenance, um, uh, you know, and, and particularly addressing protected displacement, this is an entirely new, entirely, you know, uh, 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 topic that is, you know, a lot of conversation is going on. But then just to um, summarize it, um, when you look at um, uh, protected displacement, is uh, that susta the sustained or consistent um, state of stuckness? People are immobile, right? Immobility means not necessarily in terms of, uh, you know, movement. So you'll find that people who are in protected displacement can necessarily move around freely in different locations. Therefore, they can't be able to extract resources to meet their uh, basic needs, get the resources to meet those needs in a sustainable manner. Um, it also means that uh, more often than not, they are marginalized or socially excluded. So they have that relational um, state of limbo where they are sort of excluded in a corner of their own and you know um, cannot uh, be able to create those social bridges so that they can uh, build that um, social capital. Um, then of course, they don't have much rights. They, they're not included. They are, don't have a, a lot of decision-making power and so on, which then leads to their uh, material precarity that then leads to um, uh, uh, this sort of care and maintenance. So the solution to that means addressing those key points. Um, how do you build those, that social capital? How do you build those bridges so that they can expand their scope? Um, you know, they can be able to leverage on those relationships to expand their network, to expand their resources. Um, how can you provide and protect them to increase their ability to move around freely so that they can be able to take advantages, advantage of different locations to um, uh, enhance their resources? Um, as well as how do you make them less marginalized? How do you make them you know, feel more included uh, and engaged? Thank you. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you have, I give you the advantage of not being here physically with Asmi Randa. So please let me know if you would like to take the floor to reflect on any of the questions or you want me to go for a, a last round of questions. Maybe just to, to add on to what Andrew was saying, I think 
a key ingredient that needs to be in place is political will. And not just political will in terms of the government, which of course is very important, but also political will amongst donors within the UN, within humanitarian community more broadly, and the willingness to actually work together. And I say this because, for example, in, in Ukraine, we have our, our humanitarian coordination side, we have the development and recovery coordination side, but we are speaking completely different languages. We are working at very different paces. We meet in very different forums. And this is a system that is actually perpetuated, even though we talk about making connections. And going back to the point that was made about CCCM being you know, a gateway or building bridges, I think one of the things that we struggle with is bridges to where. Um, and if we don't have that joint planning and if there isn't the political will or just will in general um, within the humanitarian community and within um, you know, the government and the local communities, it is very difficult for us as CCCM actors to actually facilitate those solutions. Thank you, Miranda. Then we have the last round of questions. One, two, three, if that's okay. So we start here. Two, three. The floor is yours, and please pass the mic to the I think this round we have more female questions. Delighted. I can, I can yeah. notice that. Uh, it's Amy from uh, CCCM Mozambique. I have a question about um, returns. So I think return returnees and return has um, two aspects for relevant to CCCM. One is being the um, areas of return and sustainability of the solutions, basically, which we see in the previous um, section um, in the um, in the session with South Sudan that they actually facilitated return and supported the return areas for the integration of returnees as TCCM. But also with area-based approach, we sometimes work in the areas that we don't have only IDPs and host communities, but also returnees as well. So CCCM has linkages with returns and returnees. And it's again, very important for the sustainability of the solutions and progress report actually shows that um, returnees often don't have access to any kind of support and they might not remain their return status for a long time. So my question is how CCCM can support uh, return in a more sustainable manner. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Next. Hi, everybody. Um, I have a question around diaspora. Surprise, surprise. Um, I think when we're talking about durable solutions, there's already a lot of good examples that I have in my mind of diaspora already doing this work. And when we talk about partners to help us cross that bridge, I can't really think of any better a uh, stakeholder, especially since diaspora aren't just humanitarian or development actors, but really across the nexus. So my question is really how we can market CCCM to diaspora communities. You know, a lot of times we're talking about local communities and they do support local actors, but how can we also take advantage of diaspora and the resources that they provide? And I'll also hand it over to uh, Muna as we were talking about this from, from her perspective. Hello everyone, my name is Muna Mude. I'm originally from Somalia, but I am now living in the United States. Um, I'm a former refugee myself, and literally I was born in a DDAB refugee camp, which is one I think in the early 2000s, one of the largest refugee camps in Kenya. So I, you know, I'm not just talking about it, but I have also seen the lived experience of what it's like to be a mobile population. And so as I now grew up in the United States as a refugee, um, you know, I have been doing a lot of advocacy work around uh, displaced population, refugees, back home in Somalia. I'm a Somali, so I'm still doing advocacy work for my people. And so I have witnessed how my community, my people, we dedicate a lot of efforts in organizing fundraising. Like sometimes we raise over $100,000 when floods hit some parts of Somalia, like Vladwene, Kismayo, Baidoba. So we have been doing a lot of efforts, and I just wonder how can we be involved in TCM 
objectives and strategies and really uh, contributing to the impact that you all are doing. Because I would have never discovered about CCM if it wasn't for the IOM Washington Diaspora Engagement Unit. It's because of them that I was aware of this particular conference. And I'm so grateful to my colleagues at the IOM Diaspora Engagement in Washington, DC. So I would love to learn more about how can we really uh, contribute or complement the work that you guys are already doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, the last question is yours. I'm reflecting on, uh, this is our last plenary session, and I'm reflecting on all three days, and I would really love to hear the panelists, and I, I know you don't have the advantage of having maybe attended those sessions online, but maybe someone else in the room has good reflections. I would love to know how we as CCCM can, in, can link these ideas up about climate, because we were really encouraged to not think um, so short term about where people are going and where they need to be, um, where they need to be resettling when on the first day. And then we were also yesterday kind of encouraged also to work more with local partners and, and more with youth groups and more with women's organizations. And so I'd really like to hear from the panelists, all three of you, if you can, help us link these, these two topics that we've already been thinking about back to our practice every day and how we can engage more to be um, working towards solutions which are climate-minded, which are working with local organizations, women-led organizations, um, so that we're really representing the needs of the displaced populations and not just those of political leaders. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, if, if I may, because we have five minutes, uh, Charlie will fire me, believe me, and I will lose my flight, and I will come out there if request refugee status there with you wherever you are in Qatar. So, but if uh, we will have also again time for other questions to be answered, and I would like some of some of the questions have already given the answers along the path. I think there were more reflections, so maybe I would just again like to give the last. Um, a round of floor, floor today to the panelists to give the answers to any questions I would like to. Hmm. I'll give you an idea. <laughs> you want to start? <laughs> you want to start? Um, and then, sure. Right. Sure. Um. Uh, let me let me start with uh, the points around um. Uh, Amy from uh, Mozambique, I think the point around uh, uh, supporting sustainability. Um, there, and I like the way you've broken it down. So there's there's place-based issues, and then there's the people issues. Um, more often than not, in, uh, again, we in implement in very political environments, and people have reasons why they want people to return to certain locations, right? So um, if the process does not adhere to those principles around uh, voluntariness, uh, around them being able to... Um, uh, you know, make that decision for themselves because people are complicated. I'll give you an example of Somalia because that is the one that is most uh, I'm most familiar with, uh, having uh, worked a lot in that environment. Um, people move for specific reasons. Uh, in the short term, they move, um, you know, to access safety, security. Uh, they move because of humanitarian assistance, very short term, and they move because of basic services and. Most often than not, this um, uh, where they get these things are in urban areas, which then fuels this large uh, urbanization push. Um, and um, in the intermediate to the long term, they are looking at now how to diversify resources. So oftentimes they split families, some are left home and so on. So if you force such a person to go home, essentially you've killed an entire network. And the, the issue is that we always see these individuals as households, as individuals that present before us, while they see themselves as networks that span across different locations. So each of that, that household sees themselves as acting um, as, as part of a resource that feeds to the network rather than what I am getting myself as an individual. So step one is essentially adhering to that. Step two is also looking at what is in these locations that uh, these people are going back to. Um, sometimes the way um, returns are framed is that ah, once you're back home, then that's it. Right, there is no restoration of livelihoods that might have been left, uh, might have been lost. Uh, no restoration of infrastructure that have, might have been uh, lost. Um, another example, again, this is now cross-border. If you look at um, uh, the push from a uh, push on um, voluntary repatriation of Somali refugees uh, between 2014 and 2017, um, they were being asked to go to Kismayu, Mogadishu, um, I think um, Afgoya or some Bolo or whatever, and Baidoa. Some of these places didn't have any basic services. While they were in uh, Dadaab, they had education, they had all these things, health services, and so on. So it's unlikely that that is going to be sustainable. So what 
ended up happening was this what was called circular migration. They go then come back. So it's also important to um, as as you ask people to go back, prepare them, uh, engage them in that decision making process. This so-called go and see visits, um, um, so that they can also you know have the feel and make a choice for themselves to make it more sustainable. Because in the long run, it will be more costly um, to move them. Um, the point on diaspora, very quickly. Um, it's a good point, um, but I think uh, there are two things that we, we need to do uh, uh, again. And I, I thank you, Moon. I think I'll use the Somali example, uh, uh, you know, to to make my point. One, build trust. Two, build um, a, a consensus around what uh, what you want to achieve together. Um, building trust. Um, the 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 response to emergencies in Somalia has like two tracks. There is the international agencies that uh, all we are all part of, international aid system. But then there is that localized uh, system that is mobilized outside that aid, and there's a reason for that. Um, most often, and I think Mona can correct me if I'm wrong, um, there is a lot of mistrust uh, when communities see these aid actors involved in you know aid distribution and so on, because aid in places like uh, the way we, where we uh, quarters are to implement is very political. So people usually question, what is your motive of bringing this aid? Are you trying to you have a political agenda and so on? And if there's no dialogue, that's a problem. Second is around consensus. Um, the logic of international aid um, uh, around, um, what do you call them, uh, accountability, aid diversion, marginalization may not necessarily align to the local context. So Somalia is a particularly oral society. Um, so once uh, you know money has been given, they will trust that it goes all the way down because they, they rely on this, the, the social norms um, you know, through the different clan systems to be able to uh, distribute. But on, this, on the flip side, we rely on MNE forms uh, beneficiary lists and so on. So sometimes these two things will not. So for, for us to be able to do that, we need to have some sort of accommodation between those two um, uh, platforms with the inclusion of donors because we know where these accountability points come from. Thank, Thank you, Andrea. And then the floor back to you, Christina, very briefly on return. Mm -hmm. Thank you there. Um, well, I'm I'm not CCCM. I can't really talk what CCCM can do to support the return, but I just wanted to. Um, flag that there is a problem with the definition of returnees and how we're using it in operational data. Very often when we say, when we, and we had that issue also with progress, um, we are reporting people being returnees just by the fact that they moved physically to location of the origin or adjacent area. We're not talking about them ending their vulnerabilities. So I think there should be a bit of nuances in the language. Um, especially if we're talking about cross-border, like we can't say that two million people who were basically pushed out of Sudan to neighboring countries are returnees and that they're fine, that they don't need any help. So I think just in terms of terminology, sometimes the use of, uh, of the um, concept that uh, IRIS is proposing is basically IDPs in location of return, which acknowledges a bit more the vulnerabilities that persist. Um, on the on on Jen's question, um, and this is a bit going beyond my <laughs> DTM hat, but one thing that came to mind, and it's really kind of brainstorming, where I think it's a very where where CCCM can have a big role um, in terms of climate change is building resilience of the communities and engage them in planning. Um, I think that's a big, I mean, at least from my experience working with CCCM, that's where the grants great strength is. I'm not sure what's the role of, of CCCM in terms of planned relocations um, and how they can support, uh, especially if we're talking about the protracted displacement caused by, let's say, protracted floods, uh, when we know that situation is changing and that certain areas are not safe. Um, but I think the community engagement aspect um, of building resilience for climate change could be something for CCCM. Thank you, Christina. Um, one minute back to you, Miranda, if you would like to come with any answers to the questions the colleagues have asked. Sure. I think maybe a final point that I'll make is on the importance of advocacy and our role in CCCM as advocacy, because really when we work talking about solutions is a bit of a mind shift. So we have to take on advocacy within our own organizations, within the humanitarian and development coordination structures within our country operations to really push for this shift and this focus. Advocacy with government um, to ensure that opportunities for inclusion are there to break down on marginalization, but also to really build that political will. 
um, advocacy with donors to ensure a certain amount of flexibility in the way that we plan and the way that we implement. And I think perhaps most importantly is advocacy uh, or supporting the advocacy of IDPs and affected people um, in their own advocacy and ensuring that they have a platform to speak about the issues that are most important to them, um, you know, including women's led organizations, organizations um, led by people with disabilities, and perhaps engaging with diasporas to help amplify these voices because ultimately we need to understand what is most important for them, what they need and what they see as solutions before we can really start to have some meaningful impact. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Miranda. Um, 20 seconds of conclusion just from, from my, my end is, first, 40% of displaced IDPs, gender displaced communities, they live in IDP sites. If CCCM is not playing an active role in solution, then who else should? So it is out of question that solution is very much relevant to CCCM. Second, among all the discussions, it's very clear that solution is also very much politicized. And I think coming back to Jen, what you said, it's very difficult to tell what is the order of priority between what we have discussed in the three days agenda, because one is very much relevant to the other. The solutions have to be people-centered. We should not bring people to us. We have to go to people when we speak about people-centered solutions, and it has to be accountable. We cannot discuss solution and enforce it on people, or we cannot discuss solution based on what political actors are coming to tell us, and we enforce it on people, because this is a very unaccountable way of doing it, and I think we have to advocate for that one as well. And it is complicated, because IDPs could be displaced for some reason, but going to another place for another reason. They cannot return for a third reason. So it is linked to many other aspects, including the climate change, which is now increasingly becoming a problem in our uh, daily, uh, daily work. So this is, this is something that we would like to foster. It will be reflected in our strategy. You will see we are working on that one. Thank you for all the, all the inputs and clicks. We have learned a lot from you, um, Miranda, Christina, and Andrew. This was very, very useful for us. Thank you very much for your time. And thanks a lot. Now you can leave the stage. <laughs>